The subject we're going to be talking about today, it was covered in a future episode, I guess. Like, it was covered in season four, really. Like, a lot of it was covered in season four. So I jumped ahead to, to really get a, a hold of that, to understand it a little better before this episode. And previously, I was just coming in from watching the specials and the first season, which are like really long episodes. So I'm just like, cool, this is like a 40 minute thing, much easier. And by season four, I was glad to see that all of my favorite people were still around. <laughs> Everyone's still here. No one has moved on to do anything different. Yeah, it's a good glimpse into the future because they kind of just, this thing is that like Palenque and Pakal are like, like one of the biggest things. So they're going to return to these over and over again because uh, the show just keeps printing money. So they have to keep finding things to do with aliens. So uh, yeah, we'll probably have to circle back to a lot of these things as we move through the show as new stuff comes up. No, it's fun though. I got a glimpse of, of how the show were, will progress in the future. It feels like the gang's all here. I was, ex- I was expecting I guess, to see different faces, to be the, the faces of ancient aliens four seasons in, but it's the same old gang. And it was like, it was like nothing had changed at all. And so this show has like, what, 15 or something seasons? Yep. If they, if they get, if they keep having the same handful of guests on constantly, then I don't know. Maybe maybe it just turns into a comfort show at that point. Maybe you're just like, you know what? I don't have anything else going on. I want to watch the crew talk about ancient aliens some more. And then we can respond in kind. What's really funny is that eventually you get to a point where the voiceover gets replaced with the guy who played Jim Rayner in the StarCraft games. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that at all, but that, that's a fun thing to look forward to. Do they get, you know how like the last two seasons of Mythbusters was like a total rework of the show where they're like, we don't, we don't even have the build team anymore. It's just Jamie and Adam. And we're doing like text on screen. Like it's edited totally differently. We're trying to breathe some you know fresh life into this. Uh, it, does that happen at all to this show? Do you know, or does it just kind of follow the same basic formula and style? for 15 seasons if i remember correctly they start going into like they start running out of like the canon material okay and then they just start going into like just absolute like goofy things like things that are like known hoaxes or um <laughs> things that are out. yeah they they definitely are like um they're they definitely are doing the television show version of like when you have a 10 page essay and you write down everything you want to do and you're only like two pages in and you're trying to find ways to make all the periods bigger and you're just trying right. if you do 2.5 spacing and it's a personal essay about me writing this personal essay right now i'm typing on my screen and now i'm looking out the window i mean look we're talking ostensibly about still the first episode and yet in season four they're already circling back to yeah. palenque and everything so uh from what i can tell and we'll t- figure out how to make this show, uh, you know, adjust to it accordingly. But essentially the show circles back uh, on a lot of its topics because uh, it definitely, they might've thought they weren't going to get more than one season. So they try to do all of the hits, the big hits at the beginning, but then they were like, Oh, uh, turns out kind of chariot of the gods uh, only gets you so far. Yeah. Kind of, kind of did all the big stuff already, but a lot more, to discuss. I'm excited about this one. This is a fun one. This is a really interesting one. Yeah. Oh, by the way. Hi, everybody. Welcome to It's Probably Not Aliens, a podcast where we watch, we we ostensibly theoretically watch ancient aliens and we talk about all the cool history and stuff that they're trying to paint over by saying aliens. That's true. My name is Scott Nicewander. I know basically nothing. I'm the person who is just kind of an audience member listening, much like yourself, listening and learning about history and uh, trying to uncover these weird hoaxes, I guess, or bad uh, history telling from the show. Thanks to my good buddy, Tristan. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tristan Johnson. You can already tell that we're like our patients for the the bullshittery of the show is getting <laughs> like thinning out. Like in the beginning, we were like, we're going to be nice and cozy. Don't worry. You're not going to feel yeah. judged. And, like in episode five, we're like, this is the show is shit. <laughs> this is the show. I will um, say this. It is. I, I made a joke that it was like a comfort show, but it kind of is. It has that vibe of just like, 
I can put it on in the background. I can put this show on in the background the same way that I can something like American Pickers, where it's just like, I don't care what they're doing. I'm just going to play a Nintendo Switch game while it's happening, just so there's noise on. And there's a need for those kind of shows. I just wish that it was a show that didn't spread a whole around a whole bunch of misinformation, you know? Yeah. And as we learned last week, it can be a little damaging. It sure can. But today we're going to talk about something that we'll probably return to several times on this show because there is a civilization uh, in southern Mexico called the Maya people who had a lot of great constructions and amazing monuments had a huge and uh, developed civilization that went through a brutal collapse. Although, you know, they're still around today. They aren't gone, but the sort of high point uh, had a collapse. And for a long time, we didn't know. We still don't 100% know why this happened. We have some pretty Mm -hmm. good ideas. And for a long time, we knew they had a language. We could see it, but we couldn't translate it until about the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So... All of that stuff, the 1970s being after the book, you know, Chariot of the Gods and after the New Age movement decided to latch on to a bunch of stuff. So this is like a there's a mystery to it. There's a lot of very unique, cool things about Maya culture that has led to it being a lightning rod for people who are into kind of new agey pseudoscience stuff. Yeah. And this is probably the Mac daddy of them all. This is it. This is the one I, I was very excited about it because the episode uh, it's the, f- the, what I watched that kind of goes into a lot more detail about it. I feel is, is season four, episode one of ancient aliens. And they describe this as like pretty much the smoking gun for the ancient astronaut theory of like, this is definitive proof. This is the biggest representation that we have ancient aliens. They're real. They were here. This is it. So, so what's the, the thing is, um, it is a slab of stone. It is the cover of the sarcophagus of King Pakal from the city of Palenque. It is about 1400 years old. It is one of the treasures of of Mexican archaeology. And to look at it, I mean, when you look at it just on the surface, it looks like something really strange. You can tell there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And ancient astronaut theorists have been looking at it and saying, well, if you really look at these pieces, it looks like. Pakal is some sort of rocket man. Yeah, just to kind of, uh, you you all can Google this at home. Uh, I just Googled Pakal stone slab ancient aliens and a lot of stuff came up. But you can do it on uh, on just Google images and you can see it. But just to paint you a little bit of a word picture, it's this big piece of stone that has like so many intricate carvings in it. It just looks like a dude who's sitting in a chair, but it's in a weird position where he's more facing upward than outward. And I guess it depends on the angle you're looking at this from, but uh, there's all sorts of weird, uh, intricate carvings in, it looks like different wires or technology. It looks like energy. It looks like it's, he's sitting in some sort of encased vessel. It, It looks Very interesting and very much like you could look at it and see all kinds of meanings from it. Mm -hmm. And ancient astronaut theorists will point out that it looks like his hands are operating dials and levers, that it looks like he might have some sort of breathing apparatus in his nose, that there's a rocket exhaust coming out the bottom Mm -hmm. with smoke, accompanying smoke, and that this has to be a sign that this guy was doing space stuff because this looks like an astronaut, an ancient astronaut. Indeed. So that's the claim we're going to look at today. (laughs) No, I think we're done. Uh, This is an ancient astronaut case closed based on what the only evidence we have is that it looks like it to me. Yeah. And we'll see this in a few other things like with the airplane, uh, the golden airplane found in South America Mm -hmm. and in the Egyptian airplane that we talked about that had, that they strapped on things to make it flyable. (laughs) Um, That there's a lot of like, because people designed things a long time ago. Yeah. uh, They did not have modern day things to compare against. 
So when they designed things, they didn't think, hey, uh, I should probably change the look of this bug carving I'm doing because it kind of looks like an airplane. So it doesn't look like a bug to me. But if you don't have the icon of that in your head, then it, it doesn't it doesn't happen. Right. And a lot of ancient alien stuff, like a lot, like this is probably one of the most common arguments that comes out there next to it's too advanced for the people that are there that I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, having done six minutes of research mm -hmm. or the other one is this thing looks like a thing. Therefore it is, it is that thing there. You're right. There is so much of that where it is like, if you compare the way that this looks, it looks so much like modern astronauts and modern rocket ships. It's like, well, yeah, because you have the context for those things, for those modern things. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason it looks like that to you. Now I am not a Maya speaking person. Uh, there are Maya speaking people. I've met them. I've been to Mexico a few times. So this one I have a very special attachment to as a uh, person who was not too far from actually being a pre-Columbian Mexican uh, archaeologist. That was like my original uh, dream job before. That's awesome. The language requirements, essentially, uh, well, <laughs> um, kind of uh, screwed me over. That's a pretty big barrier. Um, yeah. Yeah. Learning Nahuatl is uh, it's hard to do and it's uh difficult to get into classes for it and stuff anyways mm. uh this is a wonderful uh specimen of maya art and the person who was buried in the sarcophagus that this was made for is a famous king by the name of kinich janab pakal the first otherwise known as pakal pakal the great or Aho and the Shield Sun. Hmm. So that that that's um those are just various titles. He was a he was a king and is notable for being uh, one of the longest reigning kings in human history. He reigned for sixty eight years, which is the fifth longest reigning monarch in history. Uh, yeah, you're putting him right up there with uh, with longest reigning monarchs like Seti the First and Queen Elizabeth. Mm. Yeah, so <laughs> very much very impressive. Yeah, and. To this day, he's still the longest reigning monarch in American history. So there's that. Yeah, that's uh, quite a quite a history. And he was the longest serving king for over a thousand years at one point. Basically, that, I think until Queen Elizabeth II <laughs> or um, possibly maybe possibly somebody else. But Queen Elizabeth, it's actually like kind of obscene how long Queen Elizabeth II has been queen. Yeah. But also, while Pakal was ruler of the city of Palenque, he was overseeing pretty much like a great period of expansion, a golden age. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of construction. There's a lot of expansion. It seems like from all studies that Palenque kind of had this like golden age as it was under Pakal's rule. Mm -hmm. So not only was he a very long reigning king, which, you know, is impressive in its own right, but it was also a period of great like growth and prosperity, yeah. which means that he was very highly revered. That's why they built an entire temple complex to him. That's probably why he was called Pakal the Great. Mm -hmm. This is pretty because he wasn't just good. He was great. Yeah. And that means that, yeah, the monumental stuff that's been built to preserve him or preserve his uh, you know remains is some of the most interesting and unique and complex parts of Maya architecture. Yeah. And so it is an absolute cookie jar for people who uh, study this, these people. Yeah. So the thing that we're talking about today, because I'm sure we'll get into Palenque, like there's, there's theories that Pakal was an alien himself, oh, man. that he was a giant. Oh man. Um, even though I think his bones are still intact, but could he be both? Could he be a giant alien? Could be. So there's, there's a lot of different claims to hack into also that Palenque had some like associations with the stars and all sorts of stuff that is really interesting. But today we're singularly focusing on the slab, yeah. the stone sarcophagus lid that is got this whole, uh, rocket apparatus on it. Yeah. I can assure you, Pakal will be back on this podcast. Mm -hmm. We will talk more about it. Actually, I think if I remember correctly, Pakal is actually hidden in the album art that Scutch wonderfully made for us. Oh, is that true? Yeah. I think it's like in the background. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, look on our, uh, look on our little podcast logo. You'll find it. Mm -hmm. There it is. You see it. So looking at him, you can see he, uh, all the stuff we said, but also around the edges of the sarcophagus are a bunch of cosmological signs because cosmology and astronomical stuff was really, really important to the Maya people, but also symbols of the star, the moon, and also various noble people who existed at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the major image in the center 
which, uh, you know, our rocket ship, if you will, is a cruciform, a cross, which is not a Christian cross, but it is a very big, important symbol in Maya cosmology and Maya uh, religious practice. Yeah. And uh, you'll see this in a lot of Mesoamerican religion and spirituality. It's one of the reasons, it's one of the things that the uh, Franciscans and uh, Dominicans, when they, the friars, when they came over to try and convert the Mexicans, Mm -hmm. one of the first things they use to say like, oh, look, our religions are similar in this way is that they both use a cross as a symbol, although theirs is equicided. I see, yeah. And it's supposed to be an embodiment of a bunch of different things. Basically, they had one symbol that embodies the four cardinal directions. But then on top of that, like things have been added on to it to represent colors, to represent elements, uh, to represent different uh, creatures and and things like that. Uh, One of the big Aztec gods uh, was like the god of the east because uh, uh, Quetzalcoatl, who is the probably if you were to name one Mesoamerican god, it'd probably be that because he's in. Final Fantasy, usually. (laughs) This is when it is revealed that Scott is also not a gamer. Oh, no. Um, (laughs) Quetzalcoatl is uh, the god that legendarily the the Aztecs mistook Hernando Cortez for. Okay. And then they worshipped him. It's sort of, uh, they sort of play into the themes of that in the road to El Dorado. Ah, yes. I <laughs> yeah. know. I know that one. <laughs> yeah. So they, they, they associated it because Quetzalcoatl was the God of the East. And then it came from the East and gotcha. uh, that kind of thing. Gotcha. Uh, and yeah, so like a lot of times in a lot of Mesoamerican gods or symbols, they kind of get layered on top of each other. So the four cardinal directions, the fourfold nature. It was supposed to represent also like a crossroads of sure. the world and the underworld. And also, you know, uh, four just ends up being a big number in Mesoamerican religious mm. stuff. It's a magic number. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it also, because they study very big in their uh, studies of the universe involves very close studies of the stars so the cardinal directions are important there mm. and so you can see that like direction and directionality and navigation and such is like a really big part of of mesoamerican spirituality mm-hmm. and then what uh, what that is a depiction of if you look at like the symbols of it is it's also a world tree yes and we'll talk a little bit about world trees a little bit later but world trees are uh, they show up a lot in comparative mythology. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ancient Norse people believe in a world tree. Yeah. As an example, um, this is a thing that shows up a lot because trees are rather ubiquitous. But on top of that, they have a kind of symbolic thing that shows up quite a bit, which is that the tree, you know, trees as we know them, they're on the ground. We can see them, but they have canopies that reach up into the heavens and have roots that go deep into the ground. So they're very uh metaphorical for like heaven earth and the underworld yeah i see that sorry i just got like lost in my mind because i was trying to think of if schoolhouse rock ever made a song about the number four i know they did three did they do all the numbers i don't know i don't know well you should probably play a clip of it if you can find it (laughs) here it is hey everyone editor scott here uh it's about midnight as i'm editing this about six months after we uh originally recorded this episode just wanted to let you know schoolhouse rock did not make one about the number four shock and surprise so here's one that i wrote for you just now four is a magic number it's better than three Yes, sir. E E E. And that's it. <laughs> oh man, um, that was pretty good. Yeah, more vulgar than I thought it would be. It was weirdly <laughs> erotic. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to uh, derail this any further. Uh, uh, so yeah, like this shows up a lot in mythology. Like the famous one, Yggdrasil, which is the um the world tree of Norse mythology. Is that how you say it? I've been saying like Yggdrasil. I don't I like know. How they, I like how you say it. It sounds fancier. But the, like the roots of Yggdrasil go down to Niflheim, which is the uh, the sort of bad underworld of the uh, of the Norse. That's right. I've 
I've read Marvel comics before. I know all about Norse mythology. Uh, or it's uh, it's uh, roots are constantly being chewed on by a giant dragon. But that's a different thing. <laughs> that's a different thing. Uh, but th- there's a version of a world tree in uh, Maya myth as well. Do they? Um, do you know if if? And I, I feel like I already know the answer to this. But do you know if the ancient alien show ever dives into Norse? history and Norse aliens. My, th- my thought is no, because they're, uh, white. I don't know, but I hope to find out. I hope we yeah. have to do a video where we talk about giant, like Jotunheim, uh, and the frost giants being from space. That would be great. I, you keep referring to these podcasts as videos and it delights me because <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm a YouTuber and this is always, um, this we're is always both, familiar. yeah, we're both YouTubers. So video is our medium. Wow. All right. I'll get used to it. I was like, called? this is the pod. Is that what people call it's, it? The, it's the pod? pod. Yeah, it's the pod. Um, okay. Also on the sort of celestial world tree, you see common things that also show up in Maya iconography, a symbol that archaeologists think is the Milky Way, given the mm-hmm. stars uh, uh, focus. Makes sense. And that the roots go down into the underworld where a sort of water monster exists as a symbol of the underworld. Okay. I like it. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a pretty it's it, it's if you are uh, if you know a lot about the symbols and you start picking apart all the different things you're like wow there is so much going on mm-hmm. here it's actually really impressive yeah it's i mean again if you've not googled this this image it is unbelievably intricate there's so much going on in here that i mean honestly it makes sense why people would project all sorts of theories onto it because there's just so much going on that you can see anything in here but kind of when you're actually like you had said when you're like aware of of the common symbols then it becomes a lot more clear of what was potentially the intent behind it yep for example uh underneath the tree is uh, or beneath Bacall in the tree there is a head of a two-headed serpent seen from the front, mm-hmm. which is a common iconographic device that is used to be, it's sort of the uh, Maya version of the pearly gates, right? It is the symbol of the entrance to the underworld, which if say you were making this for the purpose of, I don't know, being the lid of somebody's sarcophagus, that might be a useful icon to put on there. Makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And then of course, in the top, there's a celestial bird, which is a, a, their symbol of the heavens, you know, bird, sky. Yep, so makes sense to me. If you want to see a recreation of this, you can actually go to, you know, post COVID, if that ever is a thing. There's a recreation of Pakal's tomb in the Museo Nacional de Antropología, uh, which is a wonderful museum that I went to in Mexico City. And I've actually seen this like reconstruction of the slab on his tomb. So oh, it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Uh, he, he was also buried in like a jade mask because like, the Maya people did a lot of stuff with Jade. I think I just accidentally stumbled across the Jade mask and cause it's just on the same Google image search that I found. That's really wild. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. So we've, we've seen some of the symbols, but what have Maya archeologists actually like studying this and understanding of the context and stuff like that? What do they say about this their conclusion is that this is a depiction of the moment of pakal's death the moment that he descended into the underworld there you go okay that's their that's their conclusion okay about what this is can you can you explain a little bit more about that sure so the symbol of the world tree is often a depiction of the cosmological order of the universe you know the top of the trees are the heavens where the gods live and the roots go down to the underworld, where the underworld is, where people go when they die. Sure, makes sense. And so tree, the world tree is often a symbol of the bridge between these worlds. Mm-hmm. And again, the in the roots, you see this double-headed vision serpent, which is depicted on Pakal's head and is shown on many other funerary things. Mm-hmm. And it's believed to live at the center of the world. So it's depicted as basically a voyage down into the center of the world. The celestial bird represents the heavens. This is this picture at the top of the world tree. And the part at the bottom that ancient aliens calls fire, like rocket exhaust. Yeah, yeah. Rocket fuel, rocket fumes. Is the roots of the tree. L- less exciting, but still cool. Yeah. Uh, one, one description of this showed that that's not just 
typical for depictions of the world tree, but is pretty much a requirement because of the whole symbols about the roots and the canopy and the trunk and everything like that. That is fair. I will say in in the season four episode, it was very funny. They got an artist to do a 3D physical representation of this stone slab where they like were bringing it all into 3d space so that you could see that it was definitely a rocket ship and the artist was like i didn't take any artist interpretation at all i didn't need convincing like it's all right there you can see that it's a rocket ship and then at the very end of that segment he's like yeah and then also at the bottom i added these like rocket fuel boosters because you know you gotta have a little bit of artist interpretation here you know but like <laughs> it seems like that's definitely what was happening i'm like it's the part they threw on that egyptian airplane all over again. it is they're just like they're trying to build this thing in 3d space and they're just like all right so i know that it doesn't actually have rocket boosters but what if it did though how sweet would that be that'd be <laughs> rad as hell let's put let's put rocket boosters on it yeah uh the other thing that uh sticks out and and this is sort of a, to show how revered he was, is that in the underworld, we see a picture of uh, what's the Mayan sun. And the, the, the description I heard was sun monster. <laughs> sun monster. Um, Fun. So the idea is that there's a that part of their cosmology is that they believed that the uh, the sunset was actually this monster traveling into the underworld where it would die every night. And then it would come back to life in the morning. And if you look at depictions of this god, you'll see it's like half in the underworld. So half of it will be a skeleton and half of it will not. Mm. And uh, you see this in this depiction. And the way that it's shown, the archaeologists believe that it shows that he's riding this creature into the underworld. Again, the idea of death and rebirth and the, you know, the the sunset of this person's life yeah. is all about dying and it's being poetic. dead. <laughs> yeah, it's poetic, it's symbolism, it's it's interesting, it's artistic and fun. But also to ride into the underworld on the back of like the sun is also to show about like, you know, part of his greatness and how revered he is and that kind of stuff. That see look, here can I just say, you know how we keep getting Superman movies where they keep like T posing Superman in front of the sun to be like, look, he's Jesus. I think this would have been cooler if, you know, Superman recharges with through the solar rays of the sun. So if you can imagine that they, if Zack Snyder were to have any guts at all, he would show Superman riding the sun into battle. And I think that would be cool. It would be, although he'd get too close and we already know, uh, thank you to Grant Morrison. We know what happens when he gets too close to the sun. Well, <laughs> details, 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 details. It's fine. Uh, the other thing too is, uh, <laughs> sorry, very briefly. Thank you to all of the listeners who put up with me ranting about comic <laughs> book stuff. I'm so sorry. You, you know, it wouldn't be, Hey, it's the podcast that's hosted by the nerd sync guy if you didn't have some comic book stuff this is this is what i bring to the table whereas tristan brings all of the research and the information and the cool facts that you get to walk away with i talk about superman almost relentlessly it feels like i've talked about superman on almost every episode of of this podcast and when we get to thor you can talk about the time superman shot lightning and they tried that one on for size <laughs> Let's do it. Anyway, we move on. Yeah. So another thing that shows up often in Mayan art is uh, symbols of travelers. So when somebody's transitioning from a pl one place to the next, they're depicted in certain ways. Uh, specifically, there has to be something that shows that makes a travel possible. So sometimes there's like an umbilical cord sort of like the traveling from, you know, the womb to the to the world. Mm -hmm. There's often like anytime you're tra you're depicting somebody who's moving from one place to another, you would depict the road that they are traveling upon. Yeah, that makes sense. So if you look at specifically at the part that is um, in ancient aliens is depicted as the smoke, you see uh, how he is traveling into the mouth of the serpent, which he is walking on the serpent's beard uh, because the serpent is often depicted in Mayan art as having a beard. So on the ground where the smoke is, that's basically the the beard that he is walking into the underworld on. Oh, I see. See, the in ancient aliens, they were like, that's a pedal that he's got his feet on. It's a pedal that he's controlling. Do you, I don't know how spaceships work, how real life spaceships work. Is it like a car where there's a pedal that you put your foot on? I mean, you don't want to flood the engine. Like uh, Apollo 11 is just getting ready to take off and you're like, <laughs> no, 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 you got to. 
you're flooding it. You got to like, you got to turn the ignition. Mm-hmm. That makes sense to me. I know nothing about being an astronaut, but that seems like it's right. That, so that that's like, that's generally the, the uh, agreed upon, uh, at least the current consensus amongst archaeologists, you know, people who study Maya ruins for a living of what this stuff is. Mm-hmm. But uh, hotel manager Eric Von Daniken believes differently. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what, what, so, tell me what this guy believed. <laughs> so first of all, in his book, Chariot of the Gods, which we've talked about, I think, in literally every episode of the show so far. It's kind of important. Uh, it's, yeah. it's important. It's important, but it's not good. Like, it's important in the sense that it is meaningful to the conversations that we're having, but it's not important in that it's good or accurate. So in that... Uh, he talked about this uh, sarcophagus lid, showed a drawing, said that it was from the city of Copan, which it, it's from Palenque, and said that if you look at it, Pakal's pose looks like he's sort of in a cockpit, like the Apollo 11 or the Apollo program, because this is before before Apollo 11. Mm. So obviously uh, it looks very much like an astronaut. And if you look at the things he says, like in his hand, you can see it looks like he's manipulating controls, like he's, you know, flying a ship. He's got his foot on a pedal. And we, as we previously discussed, that's how you fly spaceships. But uh, what's often, what the thing is that this is a thing called a Saiba tree, and it has a sort of unique looking bark. And if you look at the controls he's manipulating, it looks more likely to be an artistic depiction of the bark of this tree that is commonly used when depicting the world tree. Okay. All right. Getting back to that world tree. Mm -hmm. But then how do you explain why his hands are in such weird, interesting positions then? Huh? (laughs) This was actually solved in 1970. Well, this was, this is something that my people have been talking about, but. The source was this like 1970s response to ancient alien, ancient astronaut sure. theorists. So the 1970s version of this show showed that often in Maya art, uh, this is just like a sort of way that they like to draw hands. Now you as an expert on the artistic depictions of hands, <laughs> um, <laughs> since you made that one video about Ditko uh-huh. and hands, uh-huh. you know that um, artists and art styles can fall into different models about how to draw hands. And this sort of like what was described as delicate positions for the hands sure. is... Uh, not unique to Pakal's uh, slab. It is common motif within uh, Maya art. You know, it's funny that you had mentioned my video about Steve Ditko's hands because I was going to mention it myself had you not brought it up. <laughs> no, I did like a, a big study on the way that Steve Ditko drew hands in comic books because it felt like the most niche thing I could do. And yeah, you're right. Artists have different styles and different different styles permeate through different artistic cultures and whatnot. And you can like kind of identify someone's art style by the way they draw hands it's really fascinating but yeah i think the the depiction of as you put it hands drawn in in sort of delicate positions is not as uncommon as as you would think you could make it out to look like someone is like manipulating controls but it could also just be someone trying to draw hands i say draw it's carved obviously but that they give this image a little bit of movement and a little bit of life and aren't just like static clunky hands that are doing nothing. Now I don't want to give anybody any ideas, but it'd be almost like saying if you look at Egyptian art, it looks like they're always, you know, pushing buttons. Yeah, Um, (laughs) exactly. Exactly. So therefore they must've had buttons back then. Like that's like, that's like the level of discourse we're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, The other, there's another part that's depicted as being a foot pedal, but, um, (laughs) As far as I could tell, it it is like, if this is, um, this is not my joke. This is taken from a, a, a wonderful blog that looks at ancient aliens, uh, and has done a lot of, uh, really great Mm -hmm. research on this that says, if this is a, if this is a pedal of a advanced alien spaceship, then we are far more advanced in pedal technology than they are (laughs) because that is the worst angle to put any kind of foot pedal. It really is. And you can find, I mentioned that in the show, they had an artist create a fully 3D, 360 degrees sort of uh, mock-up of what this scene looks like. And you can see the way that they've positioned the foot. It is so clumsy looking that if it was supposed to be stepping on a pedal, it would be like if you had 
uh, lifted up your leg and like moved almost like you were going to cross one leg over the other, but stopped halfway. And the foot that's like in the air is trying to press like a pedal that's on the side of something. It's so awkward. I, I can't imagine that anything designed for space travel would require that much strength in your in your legs to be able to like hold it there and maneuver it. It's just, it's so awkward. Mm -hmm. And so like, oftentimes you can tell like, this is very much them reaching. They're, they're looking like this was in many ways, them working backwards from a conclusion, which a lot of these things are, Mm -hmm. but uh, these are the kinds of things where it's like, okay, yeah, they're really, they're really looking for something. And also that, you know, feet are often in these positions when depicting Mayan people, in the afterlife in other various funerary slabs. <sighs> so it's almost like there's a little bit more of a of a, a reasonable explanation for why it's done this way. And the last one, yeah, the last one, the last one ticks me off the most, which is the breathing hose. Because they depict this thing as like a breathing hose. And so there's two things. There's one that is like, okay, first of all, the breathing tube's not connected to anything, which is strange. Um, right, right. But the other thing is that it is ignorant to the fact that a common thing in this period, well, a common thing that's a practice amongst Maya people is that they do nose piercings. Um, and so <sighs> nose, it's much more likely a nose piercing, mm-hmm. which shows that, uh, you know, Daniken, Von Daniken probably didn't do much. Like he just, it didn't occur to him to think, Hey, did, is this like, do people have nose piercings here? Didn't think about it. Immediately went to, I bet they need to breathe in space somehow. So it's probably a breathing device, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, how'd you get to the space part in the first place? Whatever. It's fine. Yeah. And so all of this stuff, like you could, if you just looked at the picture and you were told, hey, this looks like an astronaut, you could very easily come to that conclusion. I know because when Tristan was a child and I heard this exact same claim, I also believed it. I believe they did documentary on this in the 90s on the History Channel when I was a kid. Mm. So I remember believing, I remember this exact story and believing it because I'm also, my family is, I got a lot of family that are interested in like new agey spiritual stuff. So this, this is, this is a mainstay. This is, uh, this is coming, striking quite close at home. But the thing is, all the stuff that I brought up to show why it is a depiction of somebody going into the afterlife instead of flying into space comes from the common work of archaeologists, which is context. Uh, you can't really understand anything unless you're doing a large amount of comparison and analysis. And if you look at the iconography of this slab, it's really it's very straightforward that it is it's very much in line with other pieces of art at the site. And if you remove something from and also this is another thing that comes up with archaeologists, which is that if you remove an artifact from its context, right. there's actually very little that you can derive information from it. Right. This is why uh, archaeologists, this is one of the many reasons why archaeologists hate private collectors and the people who like steal stuff from sites, because even if they're able to recover the object without knowing where it is, the, mm-hmm. the amount of information you can glean from it is drastically uh reduced that's so upsetting (laughs) that's so upsetting i hadn't even thought of that before but you're right what where things are and they're where you find them is so important to uncovering just information about it from what we can tell with the icons it's closely related to other panels that are in the temple uh the temple of the cross and the foliated cross so it is like the world tree at the center of like a greater piece of art that goes through all of his tomb. So it like fits within a greater piece. And no one has any, I'm sure they do, but like, does anyone have any thoughts about those other pieces or is it just this one that is interesting to people? Usually this depiction stripped of all other context is what is brought to ancient astronaut people, which says a lot that they are taking it out of its context, taking it out of its um, yeah. archaeological understanding and outside of its, you know, iconographic, iconographic understanding that impl- impose their own understanding on things, which if you think about it that way, all sorts of red flags should be going off immediately. And trust me, if this was somehow a unique or weird piece, it would be more openly talked about in archaeological circles. Because when somebody finds something very weird or out of place, that is a very intriguing mystery to archaeologists. I would hope so. And so you have to come to the ultimate conclusion 
that it is indeed a coffin lid. Yeah, that kind of makes sense with everything that you've said so far. And that, honestly, it would be kind of weird if they were to abandon all of the usual symbolic artwork that they do for coffin lids, because this is a common thing that they do for the burial of kings, and instead depict him on a rocket. Like, what makes more sense, that this is a depiction of somebody going to the underworld or somebody going into space, knowing that this is something that is put on top of somebody's coffin? Who's to say they're not the same thing? I don't right? know. If, are we going to put a giant like picture of Neil Armstrong in the Apollo 11 capsule on his gravesite? Maybe, or maybe the underworld is not the un- not under, but rather beyond the beyond world. The great beyond is beyond our stars. I'm trying to make this work, Tristan. I'm trying to make everyone happy. I'm trying to play both sides here. You know, I'm trying to like meet in the middle, compromise. Is there any sense in that? Or am I just like, I'm just wasting my time, wasting my breath, my most precious resource that I have on this earth. What I think is really interesting to take away is that this is a very well-preserved, beautifully made, and uh, wonderful piece of seventh century art Like this thing was being carved around the time of like the early Islamic empire, like when the, the, the Quran was being dictated was when, uh, Pakal was, was, was alive. And that this through a thousand years, this thing is in remarkable condition in a region that is very, uh, very humid. And so, um, (laughs) I know firsthand, um, it is a hot, Hot place. So it's it's quite a. I mean, I, I can't stress this enough. If you've not if you've not yet Googled it, it is gorgeous. The amount of detail that's in this, and is it? It, it feels to me like what you're saying is it's almost a miracle that it survived in the condition that it has for so long. Well, that is a good sign. As well, it is just full of. It's like um, how do I explain? It? It's like the Cadillac of coffin lids, you know, (laughs) like it is so full of spiritual iconography that was just like a feast for uh, Mayan archeologists who have in the decades since contextualized with a bunch of other pieces and shows it's like a really big, it's built a tapestry of a real view into a people, people's view of the world that has separated us by over a thousand years. And uh, another thing that it's helped with, or another thing that this is, and like my archaeology and this kind of stuff, is that Mayan people are still around today. Uh, they still live primarily in Mexico and El Salvador, but um, there's a lot of uh, there's been a lot of like colonization, obviously through Spanish conquest and everything like that, and a lot of things like their language was lost, mm. and a lot of the because of the Mayan collapse as well that happened before. A lot of their cultural heritage was just buried in the jungle or like lost because of colonial conquest. And so it's also a part of the work to rebuild and reconstruct a culture that's still alive today. And like, it's pretty cool. And also you can go, you it, it's, it's a part of our global, I mean, we'll be saying this one a lot. It's part of our uh, human story that such cool things exist. Absolutely. I feel like there's a lot to take away from this episode. I feel like the overarching theme of viewing things in their context is really important. The episode of Ancient Aliens opened up with yet again one of those very annoying statements where they're like, is it possible that the the Mayans got their intelligence from somewhere else? And it's like, why can't you just give people credit for making cool stuff? It's unbelievable that they're so adamant on doing that. And yeah, I, I feel like when it comes to uh, this story, it's you look at these pieces of very intricate artwork and culture, and it's so fun to to learn about everything that you've basically said so far, this episode has been Mm -hmm. so enlightening and so interesting. And I feel like I'm a better person having learned all of it. Yeah. I can already see like, you can, you can see a lot of like how, uh, Mayan culture was very in tune with the stars. Yeah. And had a lot of interest in, uh, cosmology and space. Like they, they, well, may not space, but meticulous (laughs) tracking of the stars. The other time this briefly popped up in like, pseudo archaeology mm-hmm. 
Uh, it was another time when Maya people were abused, uh, had their culture abused for pseudoscience effort. Uh, if you remember, oh God, about, remember nine years ago when the world ended? Yeah, man, what a bummer. Because <laughs> um, like, yeah, there was the theory that when the Bactoon cycle, which is sort of like the Maya version of the year 2000 was going to happen, that it was going to mm-hmm. cause the end of the world. And so this occasionally came up in some of that literature about the end of the world, that this was maybe a depiction of the end of the world or something like that. But again, again, stripped of context. But it's another example of how uh, Maya culture specifically is a common victim of uh, sort of Native American appropriation by white spiritualist um, people who are into like, uh, you know, new agey stuff. Absolutely. It's frustrating. I will say uh, you've mentioned a a book on this show a couple times, I believe called 1491. And I have just started reading it recently and it is fascinating. It is so dense with information would super high. I'll pitch that every, every time we talk about pre-Columbian American stuff, which is a common ancient astronaut ground to go to. So every time we bring it up, we should talk about 1491 because 1491 is a a really great book. It's by Charles C. Mann. It is a update on sort of the state of, well, when it was published of like where archeology span actually is on pre-Columbian America, all sorts Mm -hmm. of all over the continents. And it's, it's, it's amazing. I remember it because I made a video about that book. That was eventually a summary of that book. It's my most popular video also gets hated all the time because people really don't like about <laughs> when you say that, uh, you know, Native American people were not uh, these like, you know, primitive rock people uh, before right. white people showed up that they actually had flourishing and advanced civilizations in many ways uh, more advanced than the Europeans who arrived. They just had, you know, uh, disease uh, resistance problems. Yeah. And it's, and I bring it up because, you know, again, this episode of ancient aliens was like the Mayans didn't have metal. They didn't invent the wheel. And I, what, something that stood out to me from this book was that, uh, that's not true. The Mayans did invent the wheel or did have the wheel. Uh, they just didn't use it for anything outside of toys like children's toys which i found fascinating (laughs) it was just like they've got this really cool thing and they're just like "Eh, whatever um but it's like if you're judging advanced societies based on if whether or not they have the wheel then like then they got it they just didn't they didn't do as uh, as much as other civilizations did with it i could talk forever about the wheel and how to have for a wheel to actually be useful, you have to invent so many other things. Yeah. And you have to have a very specific type of topography. Like you to invent a wheel, like wheels, you need to invent roads first. And to invent roads first, you need to live in a place where you can do that properly. <laughs> and like, <laughs> right, th- right. It, like it requires like a whole infrastructure of rebuilding the entire like physical landscape just to make wheels work. But that is getting very off topic. We are, we we're, we're rambling now. We're ranting now. I don't know. I feel this is a very fun episode. I'm, I'm in a good mood after this episode. I feel like I was in a good mood before it too. Cause I knew we were going to talk about this and it's very fascinating stuff. So what do you say, Tristan? Is this the smoking gun for ancient astronauts? Is this the, the proof that we have been visited before? I think we're going to have to keep looking. We're going to have to keep looking. That's maybe next time though. Next time. Tune in for the next episode. We'll get it then. I promise. If you want to keep up to date on the show, you should probably check out it's probs, not aliens on Twitter. Yeah. And in the meantime, you should check out our main hustle, our front hustle. Yeah. Uh, nerd sync for, uh, for Scott over there. Yeah. That's my YouTube channel where I talk about comics and superheroes and other nerdy stuff, but I do it in an educational way sometimes or just a fun way. I don't know. And step back on YouTube, which is a history channel that you, that you do, you do that. that I do. One. I make that one. Yeah. 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 That's not, we're not just like plugging a random YouTube channel. That's your one. Yeah. And yeah, as Tristan said, please follow us on Twitter. Probs not aliens. We'd love to hear from you. If you're enjoying these episodes, if you're learning anything interesting, what's the most interesting thing that you've learned so far from one of these podcast episodes, let us know, uh, review us on all of the podcast places. Give us those four star reviews. We want to be the most four star rated podcast on iTunes. Everyone's going for five stars. There's no competition going for four, so we're going. We're we're going to do that. We're going for four. Thank you so much, and I guess that's it. In the meantime, what did we say last keep time? Keep watching the skis. <laughs> the truth is out there. We're just going to keep taking lines from the Xbox. There it is. <laughs> All right, take care. Take care, everyone.